Today on Understanding Immigration, Judicial Current Events. To the point where NPR, you know, you were talking about the media sources saying it. They ended up saying that the migrants that ended up getting transferred were victims of human trafficking. They're crime victims, essentially. And now, do you think that fits the legal definition of a crime victim or being trafficked? If you're a parent and you, you're a serial killer, Nobody says, well, we don't want to jail you because it would upset your children and derail your family life. And this would be horrible because the children had no say in this. W what we do is we say that the adults who made these decisions were responsible for the children. They made decisions that have consequences and it's unfortunate, but the children are going to have to abide by that. And for some strange reason, when we get into the territory of immigration, we throw all of that sound legal reasoning that we apply to everything else out the window and we get involved in emotional arguments. Coming to you from Washington, D.C., you are now listening to FAIR's Understanding Immigration Podcast. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're back on Understanding Immigration. Here with me today, I have Matt O'Brien. He is the Director of Investigations at Early and was formerly an immigration judge appointed under President Donald Trump. Matt, great to have you here today. Thank you very much. It's good to be here. Fantastic. Fantastic. So we have a few things we want to jump into today. Of course, you know, so much going on in the judicial space right now. One of the key things that I think a lot of people are worried about and looking at in the immigration space in general is these flights that went to Martha's Vineyard from Governor Ron DeSantis from Florida. Tell us a little bit about that. I know there's some kind of little judicial legal challenge that's going on right now in the courts. I'm not sure if that's in Florida, if that's in Massachusetts. Give us the lowdown on that. Well, so this was an interesting uh, situation. Uh, these were uh, migrants, uh, largely from Venezuela, came over the border into Texas. Okay. Uh, Ron DeSantis found out uh, that they were uh, going to be allowed to stay in the U.S., even though they most of them appeared not to qualify for political asylum or any other form of immigration status. And he arranged for them to be placed on chartered airplanes and privately flown to Martha's Vineyard okay. uh, in the sanctuary state of Massachusetts, uh, but a jurisdiction which has never taken in any migrants of any sort. Never, ever. Never, ever, uh, to the best <laughs> of my knowledge. Uh, I think there's probably a lot of migrants on Martha's Vineyard, but uh, most of them are probably working as uh, domestics to wealthy people that live there, mm. uh, cleaning houses, cooking food, so on and so forth. And, you know, this is an ongoing problem in sanctuary cities. Uh, many of these people say, oh, yes, we should allow these people to come here and, uh, and you know, get the American dream, except they don't want them living in their neighborhoods. They don't want migrants doing anything except uh, cutting their lawns and working in their houses. So kind of similar like it was going on in the Hamptons. You know, there was a story that came out a couple months ago where they were saying they ended up finding migrants that were living inside of the forest outside of these mega mansions because they were the help. And then at the end of the day, they would have to go back and live in tents. It's absolutely yeah, wild. Yeah, it's exactly the same situation. I mean, I'm a, a lawyer who became a judge. I have never been, and this is for anybody that's not familiar with Martha's Vineyard. I grew up in Massachusetts on the ocean north of Boston. I've never been to Martha's Vineyard before. Because it's too expensive. <laughs> wow. So uh, Governor DeSantis very generously said to these folks, uh, would, you, uh, would you like to go somewhere else in the U.S.? And a lot of them said, yeah, we're, we're headed north. And uh, so they provided them with information uh, about uh, where they were going to be, uh, had them sign waivers and put them on, on a plane. Now, the sheriff of Beshar County in, uh, in Texas decided that this was somehow a crime and possibly a human rights violation. So with no probable cause to believe that a crime had been committed, which he admitted outright, he decided to uh, launch an investigation into this. And uh, he is claiming that because he launched an investigation, now any of the migrants who cooperated with his investigation – uh, he's going to sponsor them for U status, which is a non-immigrant status that allows people who are assisting law enforcement authorities in the prosecution of a crime to get non-immigrant status and stay in the United States and potentially on the basis of their cooperation with law enforcement, uh, be granted a green card and put on a path to citizenship. And just to make sure I'm understanding this correctly, you're saying simply because he con he conducted his own investigation on this entire situation, they're now going to get U visas so they could stay in the United States permanently? Well, he's going to attempt to sponsor them. Um, it, it normally, like back when I worked at USCIS, yeah. 
uh, those applications probably wouldn't have been approved. But we're in the Biden administration, which has absolutely zero respect for the rule of law. So there's a high probability that USCIS, to make a political point, uh, may grant this status, in which case that's going to open the floodgates. And everyone who wants to sidestep the immigration laws uh, is going to do what's you know probably going to wind up being the latest version of DACA, which is they're going to they're going to move for U status uh, for all of these folks. So there is litigation ongoing uh, about that. Uh, the Immigration Reform Law Institute is trying to get information on uh, the communications between the sheriff's office, uh, the immigration authorities, and between any other entities where they may have been discussing this. We're trying to get information uh, from Martha's Vineyard as well. So as soon as we're able to get that through either records requests or federal FOIA requests, we will we'll publish uh, the results of that. But it, it's, it's shocking because, as I've said, this is a place that's so expensive. I haven't been there on vacation. Yeah. Uh, I never even went there for a day trip. I could have taken a ferry out of, out of Cape Cod and gone there for a day trip when I was a kid. But the ferry and... <laughs> you know, lunch and things like that are so expensive in this place. So it, it's really difficult to understand how anyone could, with a straight face, accuse DeSantis of engaging in a human rights violation mm -hmm. by sending these people to Martha's Vineyard. And of course, the local governments of the municipalities, I think there's five or six uh, villages on Martha's Vineyard, promptly uh, brought all these people well, I hate to, to put it this way, but it, it would be more uh, accurate to say rounded them all up. Mm. Uh, they had a photo op dinner in the basement of like the local Unitarian church. Yeah. Uh, you know, gave them all hand-me-down vineyard vines clothing and, and a lobster dinner and then unceremoniously put them back on a ferry and uh, remanded them to the custody of the, the Massachusetts Emergency Management Association and the Massachusetts National Guard. And they're now being housed on uh, Joint Base Cape Cod, which used to be the uh, Cape Cod Naval Air Station. Now, So we're not going to call that a deportation yet, right? No. <laughs> well, I mean, it, it it, it, it effectively was a deportation <laughs> off of Martha's Vineyard. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, uh, apparently nobody in Martha's Vineyard sees the uh, the irony there. Yeah. But, um, and, uh, you know, then you had advocates claiming, oh, my God, they're being, you know, they're being moved to a, a, a military base to a shelter. Um, well, all of those military bases in the area when I was young and was a Boy Scout used to host Boy Scout groups. Mm. And so I have actually been on the uh, naval station there, and it's nicer than a lot of the dorms that I lived in in wow. college. Okay. Um, <laughs> And that was a uh, was a, a naval air station that in the 60s, when my father was in the Marine Corps, unless you had political connections, you couldn't get stationed there because, you know, who wouldn't want to be on a naval air station in Cape Cod mm. uh, running yeah. operations there? I mean, it's a little bit cold in the winter, but uh, throughout the rest of the year, it's absolutely beautiful. So it, <laughs> it, it's the reporting on this is the just most ridiculous fear-mongering hysteria <sighs> And uh, these are folks that have been unbelievably well treated yeah. by anyone's standards, and it, you know it's mind boggling. I uh, I speak French. I have traveled in France a uh, number of times, lived there briefly, and anybody who thinks that these folks were being mistreated should see a first world detention center for migrants in a place like France. Yeah, I, I mean, can only believe it. I can only believe it. Simply put, they are prisons. There are barbed wire fences and walls around them. There are guards armed with automatic weapons. Only select people and select units are, are, are allowed out on furlough in, in the daytime. Uh, they're promptly taken into custody if they don't return by the appropriate hour. I mean, it's a whole different thing. And here we have a bunch of crazy people who don't know what they're talking about complaining that these people have been mistreated uh, because they to were to the point where NPR, you know, you were talking about the media sources saying it. They ended up saying that these uh, that the migrants that ended up getting transferred were um, victims of human trafficking. Yes, they said they have had you know, they had their crime victims essentially. Yes. And now, do you think that fits the legal definition of a crime victim or being trafficked? No, it doesn't yeah. fit the legal <laughs> definition, and and it doesn't it doesn't fit the definition of trafficking. Of course, the reason that they're doing that is because there's an analogous program to the U visa program called the T visa program that allows victims of trafficking who have cooperated in a prosecution uh, to get a status as well. So this is very planned out. NPR is in on the deal. Um, but it's, it's mind-boggling to me that they're trying to portray 
people who were consulted about where they wanted to go being given a charter flight to a resort destination as somehow victims of trafficking. I mean, it, it's, it's just, it's so absurd that it beggars belief. Yeah, seriously, seriously. And I mean, yeah, no, just this, this, we could talk about this the entire episode if we wanted to. <laughs> it is just so ridiculous what they're doing with the Santas, you know, just getting legal involved, everything like that, when basically they just got a free vacation up to Martha's Vineyard, you know, just came across the border from Texas and a free trip up there. I'd take it. I think what we need to do is go on lo- location in Martha's Vineyard and, uh, and report more on this. Definitely. Story. I could do, I could probably do <laughs> at least a weekend on the ground there, you know, lobster roll or two. I'd love it. I'd love it. Well, uh, let's get into a little bit more that's going on here. Obviously, Martha's Vineyard isn't the only thing. Thing that's been going on in the judicial space. Some big ruling that dropped in September was over the DACA decision. Uh, talking about, you know, Obama's 2012 DACA policy. Uh, looks like you're eager to talk about it. Let's jump into it. Yeah. So early was involved in this. Uh, we had submitted uh, amicus briefs uh, in the case and had been involved uh, in, in the litigation itself. Um, so a court in Texas formally held that the DACA program was illegal, that it was a usurpation of Congress's authority, that Congress under the Constitution has the authority to set who may enter the United States from abroad and under what conditions they may stay in the U.S., and that the president has no authority beyond what is given to him by Congress in legislation uh, and the certain limited powers that come inherent in the office of president under the foreign affairs power uh, to do these things. So DACA was found to be an, an unlawful program. Now, is DACA going to go away? Well, we don't know. It, it's eventually going to go away, but we don't know exactly how because there is a bizarre argument that has come up in some of the more uh, liberal-leaning courts in the U.S., Uh, which is called reliance interest. And reliance Mm -hmm. interest, simply put, comes from contract. And basically it says that if you and I are trying to engage in some kind of transaction and you make a promise that I rely on to my detriment, I can treat that as a contract. So reliance interest is a variation on that that says that if the government does something that indicates to you that you are going to get some kind of a significant benefit from the government and you rely on that, then the government can be held to whatever promise was supposedly made. Now, that is bizarre in the extreme to apply that to immigration. Hmm. Uh, It's typically something that is applied to citizens in the context of like veterans benefits or social security or disability benefits. Um, so there's something that someone here legally would probably be applying yeah, for. Yeah, uh, yeah and, and uh, you know, typically beyond just people who are present here legally, people who are lawful permanent residents or citizens. Mm. It's very strange to apply this to immigration because there's, there's just oodles of case law coming out of the Supreme Court that say that unadmitted foreign nationals – Uh, do not have any legal claim to enter the United States. It's entirely at the discretion of of the sovereign, the U.S. government. And individuals who are lawful permanent residents are entitled to a hearing before they're excluded from the United States, but that's it. So basically, there's a line called the U.S. border, and Mm -hmm. if you're American, you have a right to come in. Interestingly enough, the Biden administration has been violating that right repeatedly and uh, refusing to let U.S. citizens who have not met COVID testing requirements back into the United States, which is blatantly illegal. We've had employees here who traveled abroad uh, when the testing protocols were still on who were delayed in in reentering the U.S. Uh, And they've been doing this at the same time that they haven't required any COVID testing from foreign nationals. If only they were that strict at the border. (laughs) Exactly. So if you stop and look at this in context, saying that you unlawfully entered the U.S., then a U.S. government official, in this case the president, uh, created a program out of whole cloth that he had no authority to create, which was totally illegal, but you relied on that and you now may have some interest in staying here. It's, it's just, it's absolutely absurd. It defies the existing precedent, but also undermines the whole distinction between U.S. citizens and people in the rest of the world. And uh, there was an old sitcom, I can't recall which one it was. One of the characters used to refer to an exchange student as that kid from not America. (laughs) And immigration (laughs) law basically divides the world into two places. There's America and not America. And if you are from not America and you're not American, 
then you don't have any legal right to enter the United States, except to the extent that the U.S. government grants you license to do that. So if we have said, uh, you know, you have an H-1B visa saying you can reside here for five years, as long as you are complying with the immigration laws, you can come in and out. But each time you have to be formally admitted by the government. If you're a lawful permanent resident, you have a right to reside here permanently as long as you are complying with the laws. But if you break the laws and then leave, we don't have to let you back in. And if you do something while you're out, like staying out beyond, there's uh, generally speaking a one-year limit that lawful permanent residents can stay outside of the United States. If you stay out for a year and two weeks and you come back and you don't have a good excuse, well, then Customs and Border Protection doesn't have to let you back into the U.S. And that that's true all over the world. It's an incident of citizenship. Uh, in a sovereign nation. Sovereign nations can decide who they want to let in and under what circumstances. And there's a movement afoot now in the U.S., uh, which I think DACA was, was the forefront of, to try and claim that people who are not Americans have a lawful right to come into and remain in the U.S. And that's the whole Dreamers thing and the Trump v. Hawaii case is sort of all connected. The Trump v. Hawaii case explicitly argued that foreign nationals who were barred by a government policy had a right to sue uh, to, to, to retract that policy. Uh, and, and DACA was a variation on a theme saying people who came here uninvited and were not being permitted to stay could stay because they were dreamers and they had absolutely no control over this. And to put that in context, if, you know, if I'm a U.S. citizen, I'm driving down the street with my two nieces in the car and I'm drunk mm. and I can't operate the vehicle and a police officer pulls me over, well, guess what? I'm going to jail and my nieces are going to be separated. They're going to be taken out of my custody. And so this notion that, that you know, somehow separating people who came here unlawfully which we do for their own protection, when we are detaining them to determine their status, that that's wrong is absurd. And then when you take into account, you know, so if I'm from Portugal and my parents brought me here illegally when I was five, why is that a basis for me being allowed to stay here? I mean, it, it's unfortunate. And from a human perspective, it is sad that somebody who may never have known their native country uh, might be asked to relocate to someplace that they're not eminently familiar with. On the other hand, if you look at the opposite side of it, their parents picked them up and brought them here as a child to a country that they were not familiar with and did it in violation of the law. And, you know, we, we don't accept the same arguments in different contexts. If you're a parent and you, you're a serial killer, nobody says, well, we don't want to jail you because it would upset your children and, and uh, you know, derail your family life. And this would be horrible because the children had no say in this. What we do is we say that the adults who made these decisions were responsible for the children. They made decisions that have consequences, and it's unfortunate, but the children are going to have to abide by that. And for some strange reason, when we get into the territory of immigration, we throw all of that sound legal reasoning that we apply to everything else out the window, and we get involved in emotional arguments, which, you know, in the end, don't serve us, and quite frankly, don't serve most of the immigrants very well either. Yeah, it almost seems like with the administration that these laws are more suggestions than they are actual pieces of legislation that we should be following in the courts. I could not have put it better myself. I, I, I think that's exactly it. They're treating these things that started with Obama. Actually, you know what? I, I, I should say it's not just the Democrat thing. There are successive, and I've said this time and time again, successive Republican and Democrat administrations that have selectively ignored whatever portions of the immigration law that they either don't like or that cause controversy with their constituencies or perceived constituencies or perceived mm. future constituencies. Of course. Um, they just ignore them and, and they, uh, via executive fiat, enact policies that say, oh, we're going to ignore these laws. Well, that's not how the rule of law in the United States works. And once again, this is not something that we would tolerate in any other area of law. As a matter of fact, a mere suggestion until very recently that we should approach anything legal that way, uh, you know, was just roundly mocked any time it was brought up. It was with... Uh, you know, the recent riots during the pandemic where you had uh, large numbers of prosecutors saying that we should just ignore crime uh, for policy reasons and not prosecute it was the first time that anybody, uh, you know, attempted this argument outside of the context of immigration with a straight face. And, uh, you know, whether it's immigration or crime, the fact is when, when you start ignoring parts of the law, it will, you undermine the whole rule of law and the system gradually starts to fall apart.
Yeah. So, well, Fair reported last week that under the Biden administration, we had over 5.5 million border crossers over the past two years alone. Now, looking at that number and also, you know, understanding and learning now that there's sort of this elasticity of the law that's going on. Would you say those two are related or is this something that's been happening deeper down the line? Because obviously you've been in this business for a while. Um, I, you know, it's I think the answer to the, the question is, yes, it's both. I mean, over time. You know, there have been and, – and FAIR has been involved in, in, in making estimates of the, the number of illegal aliens in the United States. And it's always been crazy high. It's been something north of, you know, 12, 14 million people. And something that definitely contributes to that is the 1.1 million gotaways that we've had. You know, CBP, you know, they're, DHS, they're never going to report those type of numbers. It, it, exactly. Now, the difference with the Biden administration is this is the first time that you have had groups of non-U.S. citizens – uh, in numbers that that are larger than the population of Ireland and and a number of other decent sized nations uh, have been added uh, to the United States by the deliberate executive ignorance of willful ignorance of the immigration laws. And I mean, when you think about that, it, it's it, you know, if you have six hundred thousand, illegal aliens come in, and, and I'll get to why I'm picking this number in a moment, um, come into the United States in a given year, what you're doing is you are adding the population of Boston or Washington, D.C., both of which are cities with a, a population of roughly 600,000 people, to the U.S. every time. When you're talking about five and a half million people, you've now added six Bostons or six Washington, D.C.'s mm. To the United States. And think about that in terms of resources, food, water, housing. And we're now in the middle of a, a, a an economic recession. We're in the middle of supply chain issues with fuel. Um, we have geopolitical instability. Uh, you know, what does that do to the United States? And think of that, you know, just from a practical perspective. We have a, a hot shooting war going on between Ukraine and Russia in Europe. There's always the possibility because of the existence of NATO that may wind up becoming a wider conflict. Well, the U.S. has had experience with recently arrived immigrants and war in the past. In the midst of the Civil War, you had a large number of Irish and uh, the atrocious film The Gangs of New York actually did a really good job of, of portraying this one particular issue. Uh, my name is O'Brien. So... I feel like I can speak about the Irish without anybody accusing me of being racist or uh, or uh, xenophobic in any way. Let's hear it. <laughs> you, you had a you had a large number of Irish people who showed up, and when the recruiters came along for the Union Army, they said, "This isn't our war. We just got here. We don't have anything to do with this." And it's absurd of you to think that we should go get killed in a war over slavery when we Irish have virtually been slaves to the British ourselves. Now stop and think about that. Ireland was so bad that you picked up and left. And now you get into the United States and this country is saying, listen, we have a war coming up. Demonstrate your commitment by joining the military. And the response is, no, sorry, we can't do that. I mean, it, it, it's, yeah. it's crazy. And so what we're doing right now is we are inviting a more significant problem than that into the United States while we are in the midst of one of the largest geopolitical conflicts and most significant ones that we've seen since the Second World War. And what's even worse in our situation is that, you know, we're dealing largely with, uh, you know, more or less ethnically cohesive, ethnically religiously cohesive, linguistically cohesive groups of, of immigrants in places like New York and Boston at the time of the Civil War. You had a huge number of Italians, uh, number of Eastern Europeans, um, but overall relatively small select number of groups. Uh, now we're talking about people from all over the world. I mean, these 5.5 million, there have been people from Africa, from Asia, from the Middle East flying into Mexico and walking over the border. I mean, we had Haitians. I was just reading earlier today um, that over the last couple of days, there's been some massed groups of Venezuelans who arrived at the border, uh, threw rocks at the Border Patrol, assaulted yeah. Border Patrol agents, One and then began big flag to, yeah, running back exactly. and forth with a Venezuelan flag on the border. And 
I don't know. It, it just seems maybe I'm a little too old-fashioned and too logical about these things, but it seems to me if Venezuela has fallen apart to the extent that it's so awful, you got to leave and you want to be in the United States because it's a better, freer place, then why are you running around with a Venezuelan flag saying True. you're under an obligation to let me in? That's, that's not a particularly compelling uh, you know, asylum case. And then, you know, and once again, maybe this is because I'm too old fashioned, but, uh, you know, I was raised to believe that when you go begging hat in hand for assistance, there's, there's an element of, of being humble and mm. grateful for the protection that you receive. And yet we seem to have somehow, we, the United States, seem to have somehow gotten the message out all over the world that everyone is entitled to come here because we're somehow responsible for all the problems in the world, which is absurd. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, speaking of entitlements, that's actually a great transition point here. Early recently put out a study where it was talking about some certain entitlements that illegal aliens have been getting throughout the entire country recently. So uh, there have been moves uh, in a lot of these so-called welcoming sanctuary cities uh, to start according rights at the state level that are not available under immigration law to uh, people who are recently arrived migrants. Um, and, and for that matter, some who have been living here for a long time. So uh, New York has been one of the first states to propose a formal uh, bill that would provide free attorneys to anyone who is in deportation proceedings. Uh, and then you have a number of- something to do with Governor Abbott, Governor Ducey, sending some uh, people up there maybe? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, think it's, I think it's broader than that. There has been a move afoot to analogize uh, immigration proceedings to criminal proceedings. They're not. The Supreme Court has been blunt about this since about the 1890s. They're a civil administrative proceeding, and there's one issue. Does this person- have permission to remain in the United States. And so if you think of them from a legal standpoint, it's not like a criminal trial where the state has to meet the burden of showing that the person engaged in a violation. The burden is actually on the alien to show that they have uh, permission to be here. And if they can't show that, then they are not entitled to stay. And even if they do successfully show that, the government can rebut that by saying we withdrew the permission if it existed or this person has engaged in an act that violated the permission. So from a legal perspective, uh, an immigration hearing, and I've, as a trial attorney with ICE, prosecuted thousands of them and as an immigration judge heard thousands of them, the issue is not like a full-blown trial in an Article Three court, it's an administrative hearing that is akin to a, a proceeding to revoke a driver's license. Hmm. Um, and so there has been this move afoot to try and claim that anyone who is in immigration proceeding should get a free attorney because this is the equivalent of a criminal proceeding and they're being punished by being removed from the United States. But in reality, they're not being punished. What, what the, the immigration proceeding does is it restores things to status quo ante. It takes a person— Almost forces the law to be enforced. Well, it, it forces the law to be enforced, but what it does is it, in a very non-punitive way, it says to this person, listen— you don't have any permission to be here, so we're giving you a free ride back to the place where you have citizenship. Now, the question of whether the person wants to go back there or whether the place where they have citizenship or at least lawful permanent resident status is as nice as the United States are different questions, and those are not part of an immigration proceeding. Now, the other thing that's going on is you have had California and a large number of other states of a similar, uh, uh, you know, political philosophy, mm. um, attempting to extend unemployment benefits to illegal aliens. So these are people who have no authorization to be here and no authorization to work here, but these states are trying to take taxpayer funds and transfer them to people who have been unable to find work. Um, and, and, you know, if you put that in a larger context, you know, there's been an argument that has come uh, from people on the other side of the immigration issue for a long time saying, well, these folks are only here looking for jobs. They just want to work. Okay, well, then under that theory, if there are no jobs, they should probably be headed home, where in a lot of cases there are jobs readily available. Except they're not. They're here with their hand out saying, oh, well, I want taxpayers to subsidize my unlawful presence here in the United States because I can't find a job. 
And these are people who are not supposed to be working at all anyways. So, I, you know, this is kind of akin to, to the situation and, and, and people who are zealots about, you know, anti-borders and opening the borders always get irritated at me when I say this. But if you go home tonight and you find two people in your living room, you're going to call 911 and ask the police to remove them. You're not going to say, well, they're only looking for a drink of water and a, and a, and a bag of Doritos. And, uh, you know, nobody is going to expect you to, to, to feed them, to give them a drink, and then to pay for their medical and dental coverage and their college education until the end of time. And if anybody suggested to you that that was your moral and legal obligation, you'd laugh at them. And so would the law enforcement authorities to, to you know, who come and and – eject them from the premises. Now, if you want to take and expand that analogy to lawful permanent residents, you know, there are responsibilities that come with living in the United States, call those rent. But, you know, all of us, probably a large number of the people uh, listening at one point or another have probably rented an apartment or rented a house. You don't pay the rent, the landlord comes and tells you to get out. Mm -hmm. uh, deporting people who are lawful permanent residents, it's very similar civil proceeding. It's you had an obligation to do X, Y, or Z, stay out of trouble, not rape, kill, pillage, murder, and you didn't do it. We have a conviction here from a court or, you know, you violated some other term of your, your, your status here in the United States. We have proof of that. You are now being evicted from the United States. And I think when, you know, when you put it in context with other areas of the law that we're all familiar with, like trespassing, burglary, and fraud... Um, it all starts to make more sense. But for some reason, we have gotten into this thing that, you know, immigration uh, since the founding has been essential to the very nature of the United States. And, uh, you know, we can't exist without it. And, and we no longer, for whatever reason, have any right to expect people to obey the immigration laws. That's absurd. And that's how you undermine the legal framework on which a country rests. Yeah. And any, any form of trying to restrict that immigration automatically becomes inhumane in the eyes of the law. Or, or racist, which I've never understood that one. I mean, especially when people apply that term to like large areas like Asia or, you know, the Middle East. It's like, oh, it's... I, you know, the whole Trump v. Hawaii case. Oh, Trump's a racist. He wanted to exclude Muslims. Well, Islam is a worldwide religion that, that doesn't encompass any particular race. There are Africans, Asians, Europeans, Middle Easterners, North Africans who are Muslims. Um, so, you know, there, there, there may have been a claim that there was religious discrimination. Of course, we know that was not true. The Supreme Court ruled heartily in favor of, of the Trump administration. Um, you know, but there is a constitutional argument that there is no First Amendment freedom of religion interest beyond the border. And so if you're a foreign national who is outside the U.S. and somebody says you can't come in because you're X, Y, or Z— the, the, the calculus for determining what kind of a violation that is is different. Now, I'm not saying that religious discrimination by any stretch of the imagination is good. Uh, what I'm saying is people who don't understand constitutional law seem to think that the U.S. Constitution applies all over the world, and it doesn't. It, it, unless you're a U.S. citizen, it stops at the border. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're a U.S. citizen and you're abroad, the United States government is obligated to deal with you uh, according to the Constitution. If you're in France, the French government doesn't have to give you U.S. constitutional rights. So, you know, a lot of these terms get flung around very uh, out of context and, and very cavalierly. And, you know, the, the fact is that excluding people because they are not American and it's not in the interests of the United States to admit them to the U.S. is is not racist. It's not even xenophobic. Because it's not directed at a particular group of people. It goes back to America versus not America. And, yeah. uh, you know, the function of the U.S. government is to protect the American people and, and to preserve the rights of the American people. Yeah, and, uh, which, it, which it doesn't seem like it's doing very well right now. No, <laughs> it, it, it's not. We seem to have forgotten that the government and the people are one in the same. Uh, you know, we're here in the Washington bubble. And, I, I'm, you know, I'm sure you've noticed this as well. We act like the government are the people that are employed in the federal offices and that work up on the Hill. And that's not the government. Those are the representatives of the people. And yeah. the will of the people dictates what the government, 
in the United States should yeah. do. Exactly, exactly. And it seems like the rule of law right now in the government of the United States, you know, as far as judicial current events are concerned, is lawlessness. And that seems to be the only thing on the agenda. And, you know, it seems like right now we're looking like we're right up against it here with the uh, time limit we All got. All right, thank so, you. So uh, I will say, you know, thank you everyone so much for tuning in. Matt, So much, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, if you'd like to catch our podcast, feel free to watch on YouTube and on Rumble. We're also available on Spotify, on Google, uh, Google Podcasts, on Apple Podcasts, almost anywhere where you can find a podcast you'd be able to find us thank you so much for turning in this has been understanding immigration thank you